Yeah, this is just our little last minute revision slash preparation session for the exam, which is on Friday. Hope you're not all feeling too nervous about that. Um, I remember what it was like for me, which was this time last year when I sat my exam. So I've done a couple of these talks um, because someone said it'd be quite useful to do to have someone who had recently sat the exam to kind of talk you through what to expect. Um, because there were a few things during the exam that kind of caught me out and I felt like in hindsight had I known about it I might have felt a little bit more relaxed a little bit better so yeah we'll just see um and like Louise was saying if you guys have got any questions like feel free to interrupt me like I'm not precious just unmute yourself and shout at me or if you don't want to then just type a little message in the box um Louise, if I can ask you to keep an eye on the messages just in case I don't see them, because um, I get distracted really easily. So, so, sorry. Yeah, I will. I'll keep an eye on that as well. And um, hello, everyone. However, I'll just keep an eye on that and, and make sure you know. OK, perfect. Thank you, Sandra. You can be my supervisor. <laughs> right. OK, so without further ado, let me just share my screen with you all and pull up exam prep can i just get like a little variable if you guys can see that okay oh fine clear yeah you we can, can see, see it. it and you can hear me okay yeah perfect okay so <laughs> right so a lot of this is just oh, going to be oh that sounds really weird has someone got their mic on still is that okay now Right, we'll go for it. Okay, so the exam format is pretty straightforward. So it's going to be online. Now, you'll know all of this. You'll have hopefully done the test reach setup. But just a brief summary, it's going to be 85 questions. 75 are going to be examined. The 10 others are pilot questions. So one thing to think about is if you get an unusual question, if you think, oh, there's maybe more than one answer here, or I wouldn't expect this kind of question to come up, it might well be a pilot. So if you're not sure, just think of it as I'm not going to get marked on this one and just move on. It's funny timing. So it's going to be 102 minutes. Um, working that out, you've got roughly one minute, 12 seconds per question. All of it's going to be MCQs. So there's no negative marking. If you're unsure, then just make your best educated guess. You know, there's no harm in doing that. Um, the only thing is not to skip a question and don't answer it, because that's just, you're just losing it on marks that you could potentially get. Um, so the exam is pass fail, of course. A lot of people ask what the pass mark is. And the truth is the pass mark changes every time the exam is sat. So roughly, Roughly the pass mark will be about 75 to 80%, but like I said, that does change. So here's the pass rate. So not the pass mark, but here's the percentage of people that passed per sitting. So I think this is quite reassuring because when you look at those numbers, guys, they're really high. The majority of people will pass. If you look at November 2020, that's got the lowest pass rate. Was that a question there? No? Okay. So November 2020, that had the lowest pass rate. And when you think about that, that was the first sitting during the pandemic. November 2019 was before the pandemic kicked off. November 2020 was right in the middle of it. I think if I'm right, that was the first time this was an online exam as well. So you can understand that a few people would have failed that. And then November 21 was my exam. Sorry if you can hear the dog barking. <laughs> So my exam was November 21, and there's been two sittings since then. So when you look at that, you guys have got a pretty good chance of getting 90 odd percent pass rate again. So what's the content of the exam? You guys know this, it is based on the CMGs. I'm hoping that you guys have had the PDF copy from the college. I know last time they were quite late in sending that out to candidates, but hopefully you should have that now. You should aim to know the CMGs in full. Now, it is quite a lot of content, so a lot of it you'll know, because you guys, you are qualified optometrists, whether you're qualified two years or 20 years, you'll know a lot of this just from what you do in practice. 
But the key point is that you don't answer the questions with what you do in practice, you answer the questions with what the CMGs say. So bear with us, just focus on the exam and then you can brain dump a lot of stuff after. Now, it's really good nowadays because it used to be that 30 odd percent of the questions were based on glaucoma. And I think that's quite difficult, but the fact it's came down to 10% now is really good. For glaucoma, you want to follow the sign and NICE guidelines. Now, someone asked me a question about, so it was a Scottish optometrist asked me the question, should we just know the sign guidelines? Because that's what we practice with, that's what we refer from. Yes, however, this exam is going to go out to candidates all across the UK, and that is the NICE guidelines. The specific questions that will come up in the exam will be things like what you think the recall should be, how soon should you get a patient back, depending upon whether their pressures are controlled or whatnot. That's under the NICE guidelines, so you should know them. And a little point underneath that, no questions in the exam will include information or answer options that are ambiguous or contradictory. So the pressures will always be above the limit because between the sign and NICE guidelines, that's where there can be differences there. And a little bit at the bottom, like I said, don't do with what you would normally do in practice. Okay, so this is us getting you set up, preparing your workstation. So I had the grand idea that I was going to set my exam in my work. I thought, I'll just shut the door and no one's going to distract me. Yeah, that wasn't going to happen. So I made the last minute decision to stay home and do it in bedroom. You want somewhere free from distractions. Now, we all live busy lives. We either have dogs or children just try and do your best to keep them away from you um, and also be aware that you need to show your surroundings to the invigilator so being in a bedroom you might have things around you don't want people seeing don't want people seeing mess that might stress you out as well just prepare your room before you get actually started so you're also allowed a paper bnf you're not allowed any kind of electronic version you can't have your phone you can't have a kindle or tablet whatever must be paper you can put little tabs in the bnf because i find this quite useful i put a little tab with the glaucoma medication section antibiotics just anything that i thought might come up that i would want to see very quickly even specifics like um drug names that i would maybe forget because that's the other thing as well, it can be quite difficult to try and memorise all these little bits of information for the exam. You also want to have photographic ID on your desk, so passport, driver's licence, whatever you've got, because you'll have to show that up to the camera. And you're also allowed one A4 sheet of blank paper, it must be blank, and you will then be expected to show it to the invigilator, holding it up to your webcam after the exam. So online invigilation, it is intimidating not it can be intimidating it is intimidating you can't see them but they can see you so you don't have a little window seeing their face all you will hear is their voice you need to physically be able to either have your webcam that you can take off and move around or i'm using my laptop just now just rotate your laptop you need to do a full 360 of your surroundings you also need to show under your desk you also need to if you've got desk drawers open the drawers because they're looking to see if you've hidden anything if you've got any notes or study materials you have to have them as far away as possible from your desk the other thing is you need to either not wear something with sleeves or roll your sleeves up to the elbows remove any smart watches or fitness devices you can have an analog watch that's absolutely fine but like me running watch you have to get that off and also as well if you've got long hair you have to be prepared to show the invigilator behind your ears. So you'll be expected to tie or hold your hair up. Just do a little one side here, one side here, and show the back of your head. So they're looking to see if you've got any little earbuds or things in like that. And also throughout the exam, you'll see your face in a little window. You must remain in shot throughout the entirety of the exam. If, for example, you have a water bottle and you reach for it and you go out of shot, you will get a warning. So if you're partially out of shot, they'll give you a verbal warning. Um, there's different levels of severity for the warnings. So they'll just kind of remind you, they'll say, right, please remain in shot. If you were then, say, for example, you had to get something under your desk, which you shouldn't do, you should have everything you need on your desk. If you then go completely out of frame, that is a serious warning. And I can't remember how many of them you can get, but 
they are very strict with that and they can just suddenly without notice cancel your exam. Okay, so timing, like we said before, you've got 102 minutes, which is one minute, 12 seconds per question. Pay attention to the on-screen timer. I can't remember from my exam if the timer counts up or if the timer counts down, but just pay attention to that yourself and just keep an eye on it. But the main thing is don't panic. I found that I had far too much time to do my exam. And from speaking to my friends as well, I finished my exam half an hour early and freaked. So immediately texted my friends that were sitting in the exam to say like, are you guys finished, whatever? Not expecting any replies, thinking they'd put their phone away and they replied straight away. So most people will finish half an hour, 40 minutes or so. You will find yourself very quickly answering the easy questions because you're thinking, right, okay, I know that, move on, know that, move on. You're then going to bank time for the questions that you really have to think about or the ones that you're not sure about. So don't ever sit and look at a question and think, oh my goodness, I'm wasting so much time reading this and rereading this. You will have plenty of time. The most important thing is just to not panic, get yourself in the right mindset and just be sure of your answer before moving on. So the reason for that is that when you lock in your answer and move to the next page, you can't go back. So pay attention to what the question is asking, pay attention to how many answers they're asking for. So there will be a few where they'll say, pick two of the following blah, 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 or whatever, and just make sure that you pick two. Even if you only know one, just randomly pick another one. Like I said, there's no negative marking. And the biggest thing that freaks people out about this exam is that you will know if you've answered a question incorrectly because it will tell you on the next slide. So that, that really does freak people out because it's very easy to get into that mindset of, oh my goodness, I've made a mistake, I'm gonna fail. Just try not to, just try to treat every individual question as a fresh start. So if you start off with a question and you go, yep, that's anterior uveitis, that's great, move on. And the question then goes, you have diagnosed herpes simplex keratitis, put it out your mind. Just say, okay, new question. I'm now dealing with herpes simplex. What do I know about herpes simplex? How am I going to treat that? So just try not to panic. You'll inevitably will panic, but just try not to as much as you would. And also, if a question is strange, it's probably a pilot. Okay, so come Friday afternoon, you'll have finished your exam, you'll be feeling exhausted, and you'll just want a cup of tea or something stronger. Um, and you'll be thinking about what happens next. So your results will come out about two weeks after. And like we said before, the pass mark will be different for each exam. If you don't know this, the reason for that is at the same time you're sitting the exam, there's a thing called the standard setting panel. They will be sitting the exam at the same time as you. So these are all professionals, optometrists that are IP qualified. And what they do is they sit the exam and then they meet afterwards to discuss how difficult the questions were and how they should be graded. They're thinking about how a just competent optometrist would answer them. So you're not expected to be experts here. You're just expected to be safe. It's the most important thing for anything because when you qualify and when you're released to the public with your prescription pad, it's a lot of responsibility and you just have to make sure that you're safe and you know the basics, but you're going to seek help if you're outside your comfort zone, essentially. Okay, so main take home is relax. You do have it. I mean, so many people say they're going to fail and they're freaking out and they're stressed. And I really wish that I could get it into everyone's head, but it's actually not that bad. It's just, it's a different way of being exa examined. And once you get over that, you realize that it's actually okay. Right, so let's get back into this. So I'm gonna stop, stop sharing for two minutes. We'll have a two minute breather. Um, so has anyone got any little questions about the exam prep side of things then before we move on and look at some questions? Just gonna sit here bobbing my head. <laughs> Quick, was that okay? Sir. 
Um, hey. see the see when you said obviously like some of the questions are name two or name three are those questions is each question worth one mark or is it a mark per answer so i don't know exactly how they mark them but i would assume that it's one mark per answer i.e not one mark per question but one yeah. mark per answer because okay. you'd be expected to get like so to get full marks would be three out of whatever was asked, yeah. two, et cetera. So I would assume that you'd get a mark for each. So even and if you got like two out of three, you'd yeah. get two out of three marks rather than none potentially. Yeah. yeah. So after That's the perfect. exam, you also get like a little breakdown of the questions that you had and what your score was. So say for example, for mine, it was like herpes simplex question. Um, out of a total of eight marks, you got six. It won't tell you exactly where you got it, but it'll just give you the number. Perfect. Thank um, you. Do you see the question number so you know where you're up to? Yes, yeah, David, you do. Because um, I had a total panic during my exam because I, like I said, went really quickly and was at question number like 50. And I was like, oh my God, have I just kept pressing the forward button and I've skipped like 10 questions and I'm now not going to get 10 questions worth of marks? I completely freaked out at that. But yeah, so you do see that. <laughs> Um, and that's what they said at uni revision. Thanks, Naomi. Okay, so any more questions? Anything anyone wants to type in about the exam prep side of things or if they're unsure about invigilation or anything like that? Nope, okay. So the next little slide is a couple of exam questions. Now, these are just things that I've made up myself. Now, I'm, like I said, I'm not an expert. I've just been IP qualified for a year now. So what I did was I tried to make them up just using the CMGs as a guide. When I was revising for my exam, I actually found that really useful to get the CMGs into my head. So Sanjay will be here as our clinical expert. So if there are any questions that seem a bit strange or I've not run them properly or you're unsure we'll just we'll go through the topic with Sanji and we can get everything sorted because the last thing I want to do is confuse you guys before you set your exam that wouldn't be great okay so let me share my screen again and example questions Okay, so a little bit of disclosure, like I was saying. Um, yeah, so some of the questions might have one, more than one correct answer. I've tried not to make it that way, but we'll just see what we find. And like I said, you might find it quite useful to do this for your own revision. Although, to be honest, with the exam we on Friday, hopefully you'll all have done most of your revision by now. Okay, so let's have a look. 33-year-old male presents to your community practice with a red, painful, watery right eye. He reports a drop in the vision in the affected eye and marked light sensitivity. He's in good general health, but he noted feeling run down recently. Mentioned attending the eye hospital for something similar when he was in his 20s. Your slit lamp shows multiple opaque cells in a stellate pattern. In the oh, oh, hang on. That should say right eye. OK, so there's my first mistake. Just ignore that says left eye. It's right eye. Corneal epithelium progressing to a linear branching ulcer. So a great start, Claire. Dilated fundus exam is normal. Okay, so we don't have any polls set up like the Vision Scotland um, talks usually do. This is going to just be more of a discussion, more of a little work through. We can work through them as a group. So you can either shout out, you can type in your answer to the box. Um, I can't see the box just now, but it's fine. Um, Louise and Sanjay can keep me right. So I'll just give a couple of minutes if you want to either shout out or type what you think the answer would be. Okay, and then we're going to move on. So you diagnose herpes simplex keratitis of the right eye. And that's very similar to what you'll get in the exam. So you'll get a situation and then it will tell you and it will move on to the next slide what the answer was. Now, what will also happen in the exam, which is not how I've written it here, you will have the full story. So you'll have that little blurb. So you'll have this blurb. And then this top line you diagnose will be added onto this. So all the way through that question, you will have all the information. So you don't have to 
memorize all of this and then hold that in your mind for the next few questions it will all be on the same page which is quite good okay so what drug are you going to use to manage this condition so hopefully you guys know what that would be we'll give that a couple of minutes just do what you want to do and let's move on so you've chosen to prescribe vergan gel you review the patient in two days time the patient reports worsening symptoms that's not what you want to see you now see stromal infiltrates so what is your management now i always think these questions are quite interesting when they come up in the exam so claire um riz is asking do they use commercial drug names they can use either yeah so you'll either get the brand name or you'll get the generic name which can catch a lot of people out but that's why you've got your bnf so if you don't know what vergan is you just go to the index in your bnf and it will tell you okay so what's your management you'll refer the patient same day to the hospital does anyone have any questions on why that would be, or do you guys know that from your CMGs? If there's Claire. no question, yep. Uh, can you come back to the previous slide? So, so I think um, to be honest, as you know, as you were saying, you you could actually agree that you know urgent referral to HES and same day referral to HES is kind of what both answers should be right really yeah it's yeah. very specific the cmg on that so and the cmgs same day is same day self-explanatory they're going up the same day you see them urgent is generally classed as within a week all right okay it's okay. annoying it is annoying sanjay because urgent and same day it's very similar but for the purpose of the cmgs in the exam urgent means within a week so just for the record i would have failed yeah, you, you shouldn't be practicing, Sanjay. Don't know why you're here. <laughs> um, Aziz is asking, in the real exam, can there be more than one answer, even if they only ask for one answer? No, no. So if you do, like I had that, I had that in my exam where I was racking my brains thinking, I know there's two answers here that are correct. It was a pilot. It was a poorly worded question. So if you do get questions like that, where you know in your heart that there are two true answers, then don't worry about it. Just pick one and move on. Okay, so patient two, 25 year old woman presents for an emergency appointment in your community practice, complaining of a very painful red left eye that is sensitive to bright light. You assess the patient, note circumcorneal injection, fine KPs, anterior chamber cells and flare, and a constricted, non-reactive pupil in the left eye, right eye is fine. And this one tells you straight away, it tells you that you diagnose anterior uveitis. So which two assessments are essential to do for this patient? So again, give you a wee bit of time just to have a little look through them. These questions do take up a wee bit of time because you do have to go through and almost kind of eliminate things. I quite like to, with the blank bit of paper, just kind of write down A to H and just score out what I could definitely rule out just for quickness. OK, so I'm just going to move on to the answer. So B and D, which was do IOPs and a dilated funds exam. And I think most of you would know like why you would do that. I mean, obviously you're going to dilate them to check for posterior inflammation. Um, and which two, two drugs would you use to manage this patient? So these questions can trip you up if you rush because you've got a lot of words, a lot of percentages, and you just have to take your time with it and just make sure that you're picking the right answer. So if you work through it logically, you can be like, OK, so we're definitely going to want to use cyclo because you know that trapecamide is probably not going to be strong enough to break any synechiae. So you're thinking, right, cyclo, A and C. And then you're looking at, right, so now I've got an option between FML or PRED40. What am I going to use there? And you should know that FML, it's not going to penetrate as deeply. 
So you want to get into the anterior chamber. So you're going to get one that's going to penetrate a lot further, i.e. your preds. So you look at that and go, OK, that's C. And then you get your answer and it tells you what you're going to do for dosage. Um, you review the patient after two days and you see the UVA is responding well. You reduce the steroid every two hours for five days and then begin tapering. And then the patient mentions at a review that this happened to her last year and she received the same treatment, which worked just as well. And you think to yourself, I wish you told me that when you first came in the door, <laughs> which is what patients do. So now that you know that the patient has had this before, what should you do? So I'm kind of digressing from the MCQ. This is just if you want to tell me what the answer is or think what the answer is. There's no options. Just see what's what. So I'll move on. So you're going to refer her and you're going to refer her for a systemic review. And the reason for that, um, you should all know this, is that there are a lot of systemic conditions associated with anterior uveitis. So if you have a look at that list there and just see what you think that answer would be. This is a question that could come up in your exam. And you'll see that there's a lot in common. There's one thing that's in common with all of them. So you're going to answer E. All of the above. Okay, so to just, make matters... Sorry, Claire, just before you move on, um, we've mm -hmm. had a question asking, do they ever make up... Um, hang on, let me scroll back to it. Do they sometimes give you made-up strengths of drugs, e.g. psychopentylate 2%? No, no. So that would be that would be very confusing for candidates and that wouldn't be fair. So they will always give you correct percentages and correct dosages as well. And uh, Walter is asking, would it be a routine referral when you're saying you would refer them on? Would it be a routine or would it be an urgent? Oh, that's a good question. I, oh. I think it's a recurrent condition where, so I'm not talking about the CMG, I think. Claire, you'll tell me right. However, yep, right. Uh, for me, if somebody is responding really well to the uveitis and is going the right way, and you found out on the second visit, uh, for me, um, a semi-urgent or routine referral is, is very um, acceptable. But acceptable is not what we're talking about here. It's <laughs> the CMG. Yeah, ignore the real world for just now. So I've got the CMG in front of me. So for second or subsequent episode, which is what this case is, you've got the B1 modified referral category, which says pharmacological management followed by an urgent referral to okay. ophthalmologist for um, further investigation. So urgent within a week. And that could be a question. So well done for asking that. And Aziz and... Sarfraz got both got that correct. So well done, guys. Oh, well done, guys. And this is this should hopefully make you feel a bit more confident about the exam as well. That you can answer these questions and you know them. And if you make little mistakes here and there, it's fine. The majority of the questions you'll know. Okay, so um, like we're saying, just to make things a wee bit more complicated. The patient's identical twin sister comes in the following week with the same condition, only she's complaining of a significant reduction in vision and unbearable pain. You check her pressures and they are significantly raised. So she, her twin sister has just had the treatment. She's looking for the same treatment. She's wanting an easy fix. But what do you do? Do you give her the same treatment? Do you start her in the same treatment and then refer her? Do you add in a hypotensive because the pressures are up or do you refer? So this is one of those ones where you need to know the little nitty gritty parts of the CMGs, the little interesting things. So you're going to refer her same day to the hospital eye service. And the reason for that, there's a little bit in the management category of the CMGs. If a patient has significant drop in vision, pain, or significantly raised pressures, you refer. But then if you're a very experienced IP optom, you could possibly manage that, maybe. You maybe think about it. maybe, maybe, maybe if you've got an ESCA or something, possibly. 
Okay, so mother brings in her eight-year-old son into community practice for sudden onset pain and swelling in the corner of his left eye. You note a red tender swelling over the lacrimal sac and extending it around the orbit. The patient flinches away when you try to assess in more detail and the mother notes that when you touch the lump it expresses a purulent discharge from the functa. The eyes are otherwise unremarkable, motility fine, no ptosis, and you diagnose acute dacryocystitis. You could get a question here that doesn't give you the diagnosis because a lot of those symptoms can sound quite similar to cellulitis, I be that preceptal or orbital. So you could have a question like that. Um, so that would be what would be your differential diagnosis here when you're thinking about that. So again, I've just put a little bit, this isn't in the MCQ format, this is just to make you think about this one. So you can have a little think amongst yourselves what the differential diagnosis for acute dacryocystitis would be. And then I'll put that up for you. So, yep, you've got your cellulitis, which would be the first one, which I think most people would think about. Acute frontal sinusitis, possibly infection from a wee bit of trauma or a scratch on the skin. Trigeminal neuralgia and the chronic version of the condition. And then just straight into what is your management of the acute version. So, yeah, have a little think. Bear in mind it's a child, if I go back eight years old in your community practice because this is it's a condition that you could treat you could treat this as an IP but would you according to CMGs and the answer is you refer and the reason for that is the CMG states that in all children it should be a same day referral the only thing that I thought about when I was looking through this is there's no definition of what a child is there's no age um, Sandy, out of interest, what would you class as a child for a situation like this? So I think um, the the hospital criteria is less than 16, three by four, so 16, right? Okay. But, but there is also other reason I, I would agree on this, that um, if you're seeing a possible preceptal, the difference in um, in children is it can progress very rapidly where they need IV antibiotics. So you're much better off the, being there saying, well, I've used chloramphenicol and I could have used um, a, you know, a systemic antibiotic, but they, they go rapidly overnight sometimes. So much, even, even an eye department, if you went to QE um, uh, hospital and you were seen by ophthalmologists on call, they'll, they'll keep a very low threshold of admitting just overnight and possibly thinking of IV antibiotics earlier rather just to prevent anything getting worse. So I think same day referral in HES is definitely um, possibly the right thing for children. Okay. So then if it was the mother who had the same condition, the acute version, and if she didn't have any fever, what would your pharmacological management be? So the CMG either gives you the option to prescribe two different things, or you don't prescribe, you just refer. So this is just one of those ones that you just have to memorize the answer from the CMG. But then if you work down the options here, you can rule out the silly ones. So you wouldn't give acetazolamides for this. So you can rule that one out. You wouldn't give a steroids. So there you go. You can rule out two more. So it gives you the top answer. You want topical chloramphenicol, just in case any bacterial conjunctivitis starts to form. And then you've got your oral antibiotic as well. There we go. Most people answered. Right, that's good. You guys are going to be absolutely fine. You're all geniuses. You're going to pass. It's going to be great. <laughs> okay, so glaucoma question. 55-year-old blue-eyed female with hypermetropia presents as an emergency to your community practice, complaining of sudden onset, blurred vision, severe ocular pain and redness in the right eye. She reported having similar symptoms along with halos around lights last week, but it only lasted one to two hours and she thought it was a migraine, but this is much worse. You assess the eye and you find dilated limbal and conge vessels, a fixed semi-dilated pupil, corneal edema and Van Herrick's grade one. 
pressures are 34 in the right eye and 21 in the left. So what is your diagnosis? I think most people, hopefully 100% of you would know what this is. Yep, so acute angle closure in the right eye. That's what you diagnose and you decide to refer same day to the hospital. So what, if anything, can you do before you refer? So this is one where you look back, okay? So we've got two different options here. We've got pilocarpine and oral acetazolamide, but we've got 2% versus 4% and 250 versus 500 here. We're gonna go back. Something about this patient should tell you what percentage of pilocarpine you want to use. Okay. And the acetazolamide, you should just know from the CMG. It tells you what one you want to use there. So just one more look back at the history. Have we think about that? And then we'll give you the answer. So 2% blue eyed patient and the 500 milligrams oral acetazolamide. So you send the patient to the hospital accompanied by their partner. There's a reason why you get them to be accompanied by their partner because acetazolamide gives you quite horrible side effects. This is a horrible question. You will possibly get a question like this in the exam. What are some of the possible side effects of acetazolamide? So you're then gonna be bombarded with information. So you're gonna be given five options, but in those five options, you've got so many different options in there. And they'll put in technical terms that you might not know off the top of your head. You might not know what ataxia means. You might not know what polyuria means. You might have to look that up. So these things can catch you out and they can make you panic. So I'll actually, I'll give you a couple of minutes to look at that. Each answer is the side effect of a different drug. If some of you are really clever, you might work out what the drugs are, but you're not going to get extra points for knowing what they are. The main thing is just tell me what the side effects are of acetazolamide, but if you want to be clever and work through the rest of them, that's cool. I can't remember off the top of my heart. I've had to write it down. So, so most, most people are coming up with B. B, which is great. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, all I was going to say is two things you don't want to ever forget about um, the minute we start diamox or acetazolamide is we'll say you'll have to go to the loo a bit more that's polyuria and you'll mm -hmm. get tingling sensation sometimes they feel a bit sick so i think tingling to be honest i think um, there's a lot of almost um, side effects which actually most of the drugs have it so it's quite difficult to differentiate i think the polyuria even if you don't get polyuria uh, but tingling extremities being in one of them kind of slightly helps you, I think, in this case, so which is great. Yeah, and that's exactly, that is spot on with what you want to do. Know the main side effects that you associate with that drug. So the polyuria, the tingling extremities, you're going to zone in on that and be like, right, that's B. So when you then look at A. And I just, sorry, Claire, another quick question uh, yeah. um, is coming in. Could you check the BNF for this? A hundred percent, yes. You go to acetazolamide, you look at side effects, and that gives you the answer. That's what your BNF's for. You're not expected to know all of these off by heart. If you know them, that's amazing. But yeah, you don't need to know them off by heart, but do know them. <laughs> so A, um, they're the side effects of pilocarpine, the tachycardia, the bronchial spasm. I might give you a clue there. C was side effects of pregnizolone. D, side effects of ofloxacin, and E was doxycycline. I used to always remember the tetracycline side effects because you'll get questions about them quite often as well. So know that one too, or just put a little tab in your BNF. There's B. Okay, so this is the last question that we're just going to work through. Um, if, I should have said as well, if anyone needs to shoot off, if you've got other kind of commitments and things, I'll not be offended. You can just um, let yourself out and hopefully this was good for you. But we'll go through the final question just now. 58 year old man presents to your community practice with bilateral ocular discomfort. 
on examination, his lids are found to be hyperemic and thickened with the word that I can't pronounce of the lid margins. There's also tear film instability and corneal punctate staining. You also note some facial flushing and the patient mentions that he's been diagnosed with rosacea by his GP. What non-pharmacological advice can you give? So you basically know that he's got ocular rosacea. So try and avoid what's causing it. Um, think about supplements, manage the other associated conditions, probably one of the most important one, people don't do it. And you can consider IPL therapy. So what pharmacological management options are there? If I go back to the first slide, the thing to note is that the patient has been diagnosed formally with rosacea. Because if you look at the CMG, you cannot issue any pharmacological management unless the patient has had that diagnosis. Just pulling out my little CMGs here. Yes, so under pharmacological management, oral antibiotics, um, optometrist prescription of oral antibiotic not recommended unless diagnosis of rosacea confirmed by dermatologist or GP. In reality, so say for example you have passed your IP exam, which is what you're obviously going to do because you'll all be fine, you get a patient in that you know looking at them they've got rosacea but they've not had the formal diagnosis. More often than not, you can prescribe the oral antibiotic, but do it with the GP. So prescribe and write a letter to the GP, get their back up on it and get their help too. Um, a lot of the time with oral antibiotics, you'll want to let the GP know anyway, because sometimes they'll need like um, blood tests done as well. Um, you'll need to know their medical history too, just for that reason as well. So going back here, so ocular lubricants, that's just going to, you're going to give that anyway, that's a given. And then doxycycline, the 40 milligrams modified release for up to six weeks. Out of interest, um, I'm on quite a few IP WhatsApp groups that are fantastic. Um, so you've got really experienced IP practitioners on there that they've been practicing for a while. They know what works. So some things go a little bit against the grain, like things that, Sanji would do, you know, completely out with the CMGs, but he knows they work because he knows through evidence and we've got peer reviews and studies that show that X, Y, and Z works. So you've got all of this support when you qualify. And I always thought I was quite scared about prescribing oral antibiotics because I didn't want to get it wrong. There were so many things that could go wrong, but there is a lot of support out there and try and look out for these groups and make these contacts at the hospital have consultants like Sanjay that you can speak to and ask the questions because it does it it really does go quite a long way okay so this is a prime question that will come up in your exam in the exam you will have a list but what are the contraindications for doxycycline so you're thinking about your tetracycline groups in general have a little thinky poo about that and then I will show you so yeah, self-explanatory. If they've got hypersensitivity to doxy or any of the components, if they've had hypersensitivity to any other tetracycline, if they are a child, pregnant or breastfeeding patients, and those with renal or hepatic impairment. Okay, so whistle stop tour. Let me just come out of that. There we go. Fab. So yeah, hopefully that was useful. Um, yeah, so if you guys have any questions, any questions for me about how the exam runs, anything that you're not sure of, if you've got any kind of clinical questions then Sanjay can jump in as well. I've got another talk if you're interested. Oh. <laughs> I'm just joking. I was just joking, honestly. Just Sanjay stealing my thunder there, like jumping on the bandwagon. Uh. 
I just wanted to say, I've popped it on the group chat as well, that obviously Vision Scotland have a number of different WhatsApp groups that people can join as well. So um, we're pretty quick at getting back to you if you've got any burning questions. Um, if you're not already part of that, um, drop me an email. Uh, I'm going to send out a link tomorrow for feedback as well to get your certificates. So if you do want to be added to any groups or anything like that, or if you want to watch this again uh, before Friday, again, I can send you the link. Yeah, and I would I would take advantage of that because it is great having that link to the consultants, even just for silly things, you know, just even saying, do you think this patient would be suitable for RLE or can you give me a rough pricing for whatever? Um, the pricing's um, on their website now, which is really good. But it's just nice to have that before you put in a formal referral, just to kind of have a bit more information. Um, and the guys are great. They're really good at getting back to you with... Um, kind of good information just one quick question from me claire sorry see if we mm -hmm. go back to when you said about you'd put the tabs on your bnf and mm -hmm. i've done that but then you said you couldn't can you write anything on them like i had tabbed it as glaucoma but they just have to be completely blank yep completely blank so, yeah i will go back and change that thank you <laughs> um so yeah yeah the invigilator they will ask to look at your bnf so they'll get you to open both covers. If you've got tabs, they'll ask you to open the pages that have the tabs on them just to make sure you've not written any notes there too. Um, it is, it's, it's really strict and it is off-putting, but it's fine. Like once you get through it, the individually, they're, they're lovely. They're generally lovely people, but it's just a bit like, mm. um, We've had Herman asking, are we allowed to have two screens for the exam? I normally have two screens. I don't see why not well i i can have you can have the first screen for for the exam the second screen for all the cmgs yeah <laughs> i but, mean no, no, i'm no. assuming through the test reach software that the invigilator would be able to see what's on both screens so they'd flag that right up if they'd be like no you've got the answers on that page get that down <laughs> absolute chancer <laughs> another quick question is um, I use my maiden name for work, but my photo ID is my married name. Will this be allowed? Oh, yeah, that's not a daft question. Um, I'm sure that'll be fine, but you maybe have like a little backup that just about to having your, your marriage mind. certificate to hand yeah. you could show or your passport or something. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not going to do you any harm if it makes you feel more comfortable and more prepared just to have something that's got your name and just be like, look, here's evidence of the name change. I'm really sorry, I've not got around to changing my name on it. You won't be the first and you won't be the last to be in that situation. So I can't imagine they're going to be like, they're going to take any issue with that. Okay. Anybody and also, oh, sorry. I'm just, I'm really conscious that I'm shivering. Like I'm shivering sitting here and you don't want to shiver when you're doing your exam. So wrap a blanket around you, you know, cost of energy is going up. If you don't want to put your heating on, just get a duvet around your legs or something. But yeah. And don't worry about what you're wearing. Just wear what you want within reason, as long as it's not inappropriate, because you will be on camera, but be comfortable. Okay, does anybody have any further questions? No, I think everybody's wanting their dinner now. Okay, yes. everybody, good luck. And yeah, that's how you time. get on. So, Claire, um, are you going to organise, once they all pass, uh, can you organise a Zoom cocktail party? Yeah, that's a that's great, great idea. idea. Well, we actually just said that before we came on, we should all have a glass of wine. Um, <laughs> maybe you're right, Sanji, maybe after Friday. Um, thanks luck, so guys. much, Claire. Thank you so much for helping out today. It's been really useful. And everybody, I don't know if you can see the messages now that you're not sharing your screen, but everybody's saying thank you and how useful it's been. So, um a massive thank you from us and good luck everybody oh, good luck um, you will all be fine just don't panic good luck guys okay and as i say if anybody wants any recording let us know okay okay good night everybody night. thank you good night bye, bye. good luck bye.